life and find out about what's going on up above your head all in the same place. So we hope that you'll join us every second and two, fourth Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on Twitch, YouTube, and now Facebook as well. On this week's show, we're going to chat with Dr. Robert Hurt from the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, IPAC, at Caltech. Among other things, Dr. Hurt creates visualizations using astronomical data, and he will be here to tell us all about that later on. But before he joins us, let's welcome our co-stars. First, Director of Education and Public Outreach at the Vera Rubin Observatory, it's Dr. Alone Corleys. Hi, everyone. Hey, Lauren. Next, clinical supervisor for student teachers at Western Governors University, it's Dr. Michelle Valdez. Hello, everybody. Hey, Michelle. Next, aerospace doctor and founder of Orbital Biodesign, it's Dr. Danny Carroll. Hey, everybody. Good to be hey, here. Hey, Danny. And last, but certainly not least, author and founder of the Space Tourism Guide, it's Valerie Steinick. I feel like it's the joke from Big Bang Theory where they always introduced Wallowitz as not a doctor, but it's great to be here. Oh, we're not, we're, we didn't say that though. You're, you're going to be a doctor Sunday, Valerie. We know it. I'll get there. You just, you just let us know when you need some letters of rec to whatever doctorate program you go into and we'll be there. We'll be. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really using my PhD for what I'm doing, but it's, it's nice, nice little letters after my name. It, it serves me well. But uh, uh, you don't have to be a doctor to be here. So we are excited to have you with us. Thank you. All right. We've got some fun stuff for this evening. And of course, the James Webb Space Telescope just released its first images yesterday and today. Pretty crazy. We'll get to that. Don't worry. We've got some fun stuff for that. But uh, we're going to start out with astro advice, just like we always do, uh, life advice from astronomers, astronauts, and other scientists. So if we can go to that slide, please, Gavin. All right, so the quotation that we're gonna have the co-stars attempt to guess the correct quoter is this. 
The history of astronomy is a history of receding horizons. Very fitting for the release of the uh, JWST images. And uh, here are your options for who said that. We've got Edwin Hubble, of course, the namesake for the Hubble Space Telescope. Stephen Hawking, renowned British astrophysicist. Lord Byron, another renowned British astrophysicist. And Isaac Asimov, um, the uh, science fiction writer. So co-stars, I will give you a moment to ponder what you believe to be the correct person who made that statement. And uh, whenever you're ready, you can let me know what you think. I don't know, but I'm just gonna chime in and say maybe A. All right, we got uh, Danny for Edwin Hubble. Very nice. I agree. All right, two votes for Edwin Hubble. Valerie's going in for Edwin Hubble as well. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren? This is either going to get me something or make me look silly. I'm going to pick Stephen Hawking. <laughs> All right, we got one vote for Stephen Hawking. <laughs> yeah, and the correct well, well, the, clue, the clue to me was when you said you kind of connected to, to the James you know, Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. That's why I thought. I uh, it. All right, the correct answer is, next slide, please. Uh, it, it was Evan Hubble. <laughs> now, we, we appreciate that. We appreciate that, Lauren. <laughs> You don't, you, don't, sometimes. You, don't, you don't get far in life by following people every time. So, well, I would have uh, gotten further this time. But this, no. this time you should have, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's good to be an outlier. That's, uh, that's where the greatest minds are. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was Edwin Hubble who said that. Um, of course, we're, we're just you know 100 years out from when Hubble made his monumental discoveries that the Milky Way was not the entirety of the universe. Um, he proved that conclusively um, with his images of Andromeda and several other galaxies um, within 20 light years or so um, using the Hooker telescope on um, top of Mount Wilson, which 100 years ago was apparently a great place to do astronomy. Uh, now it's right outside of downtown Los Angeles uh, and Pasadena, so not quite as great anymore. But I'll tell you what, I, um, I got to go up there for the 100th anniversary of the Hooker Telescope a couple of years ago. And it was so cool just to look through um, the same telescope that Edwin Hubble was looking through 100 years ago um, to collect those data. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we've come a long way, of course, with the launch of many, many space telescopes. And, um, and now with the first images of um, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, we are yet again um, causing the horizons of the universe to recede. So I don't know if we have to beat this one to death, um, <laughs> but I would love to hear what comes up for uh, all of the co-stars uh, with this quotation. I mean, just love. Of... Oh, go ahead, Valerie. <laughs> Okay, uh, I just love that it's someone who spent a lot of time looking out at those receding horizons and mm. pondering what was beyond them. Uh, you know, he was driving astronomy forward while recognizing that his uh, those who had come before had done the same thing to get where he was. Nice, yeah. That that reminds me of that wonderful quote by um, Isaac Newton. Uh, where he says, uh, I have seen so far only because I've stood on the shoulder of giants. Uh, and he was talking mm -hmm. about Galileo and uh, Copernicus, Ptolemy, et cetera. So yeah, no doubt that um, that Hubble had those same ideas. Although I, I'm not sure he was quite as humble as uh, Newton was uh, from what I've heard that, that wasn't the case. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Lauren? Oh, just that I was sort of surprised to have that they had already made that jump to receding horizons because the mm. Hubble, the data that Hubble took was all pretty local, like things that were relatively nearby. And so they were even just deciding, like you had said, that there were galaxies outside of our own. Um, and so I had thought that this implication that this was a true fact for the universe everywhere came a little bit later, which is why I picked Stephen Hawking. So that's a cool thing nice. to me about this quote. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, incredible that it, it happened so long ago with such little technology, right? I mean, 100 years ago, like well before the advent of computers or CCD technology, um, Hubble was just using uh, photographic glass plates with emulsion on them to um, you know, develop 
uh, these images. And he was literally slewing the telescope by hand with these two big cranks, trying to keep the objects mm -hmm. centered in the field of view for hours. Um, you know, with, with then was one of the largest telescopes, was the largest telescope in the world, that 100 inch telescope up there. Um, so it was quite a feat. Um, and yet was, you know, just the very beginning of what we're able to do, you know, just a hundred years later. And it also just speaks to the advancement of our instruments, like the James, you know, Webb Space Telescope. So kind of that um, quote kind of reminding me, like, look where we are now. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I don't know if anyone caught Biden's speech uh, when he unveiled the first image of the JWST yesterday. Uh, not quite as enthusiastic as I would have done it, but uh, that's Biden for you. Um, but he, he did say if there's one word that describes the United States, it was possibilities. And I, you know, I, I think he was referring to like the, you know, the amazing ingenuity of scientific progress um, that has led us to this point of you know, having this colossal telescope out in space with, I can't even remember how many moving parts that all seem to be working perfectly at this point. So I thought I thought Biden, although he didn't nail it with enthusiasm, uh, he did nail it with the description of of what I think this telescope really represents for um, the, you know, the upcoming generation of, of just how they're going to be mesmerized by the discoveries that are made with this instrument that, you know, like like we were with Hubble when it first got launched. Was it 30 some years ago now? Danny, were you going to add anything? Yeah. So, you know, I actually thought this quote was really profound um, and was very poetic. And I think mm -hmm. we're so used to looking forward and pushing forward, 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 you know, onward, go explore, go push new boundaries, you know, uh, establish, uh, I don't know, just get a sense of what, what reality is like over there beyond. Mm -hmm. We don't very often turn around and look back. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I guess I understand what he's, what he's getting at, which is, if if when you're looking forward, you're thinking, okay, we're seeing the next horizon, right? We're like pushing beyond to mm -hmm. the next, uh, whatever the next like um, frontier is. Looking back, it's like all the frontiers that we've already overcome. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I thought it was beautiful. I, I guess it's a paraphrase of, of what you guys said, but <laughs> no, that's um, great. It maybe a slightly different interpretation. Yeah, you know, and I I I hope I didn't make something that was too uh, harsh about. Hubble's lack of humility, which I've read about, it, it there does seem to be a hint of humility in this quotation, right? He's he's not saying that he's like discovered the the new universe. He's talking about this receding horizon. So you, you could think about about this like the vast unknown that he's uncovered. Um, you know, his his statement that there might be or probably is um, or clearly was so much more to be understood based on his discovery that the universe was way larger than um, ever thought possible before. So this idea of not necessarily getting closer to understanding everything approaching a horizon, um, as some physicists thought they were uh, headed to at the uh, end of the 19th century or, or 20th century rather, um, but um, this idea of like receding horizons that as we explore the universe and we see its true vastness and complexity, we realize that what we thought was a more complete understanding becomes less and less so with each discovery. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm reminded of that, um, that pie chart of the universe that shows 4% uh, normal matter, 20-some um, percent dark matter, and then 70-some percent dark energy. And my, uh, my college astronomy professor calls that um, the most um, arrogant and humble diagram ever produced. Um, arrogant in that we think we know what the, the um, proportionality of what exists in the universe is, um, but humble in that 96% uh, of it, we have absolutely no idea <laughs> what comprises it. So um, maybe there's a, a hint of that in, in this quotation from Hubble. Any other thoughts about this? I'll just I'll just add that I think it's become one of my favorite astronomy quotes as we've mm. been talking about it. I love mm. the concept that every time we've looked metaphorically and literally, and every time we will look, there will always be more to see. Um, we're obviously, as we've been talking, James Webb, we're obviously all excited to talk about that. But it's clear that 
even as much as James Webb is going to unlock for us, we will just discover there's more we want to see as we look. And that is exciting. Uh, but it's always been that way in astronomy too. Every time we look, we realize we want better tools and better techniques to see. And that it just seems like it's so much possibility and hope for the field. It's never going to run out of things to look at and learn from. <laughs> you know, no, that uh, reminds me of, I, I was just thinking of a, when you just said that, Valerie, I just really quickly, I haven't thought this for a long time, but when I was a first year teacher back in California in Riverside, I remember climbing up to this mountain and I couldn't believe I got my teaching degree. And I looked up into the sky and I said, wow, look how far, I've, no, I got up to the mountain. I said, look how far I've gone. But then I looked up into the sky and I said, but look how far I can go. Hmm. And I haven't thought of that journal hmm. writing piece that I did in my journal when I was there until just that moment. Nice. Yeah. The sky is not the limit. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Well, Michelle, that's a great place, I think, to segue into the uh, next section of where we're headed, um, which is Astro 365, this day and week in astrophysics history. So uh, on this day in 1984, the units for the measurement of electrical magnitudes were adopted into US law when President Grover Cleveland signed that respective act of Congress. Those include the ohm, ampere, volt, coulomb, farad, joule, watt, and the Henry. And I'll give anybody out there, either listening to the show or on the show, co-star, uh, et cetera, uh, if, if they can actually name which SI units all of these uh, represent. What, what are they actually representing? And I, I will admit, I had to look two of them up. Um, I, I was able to get them all by memory, except two of them. Um, anybody want to make a stab at what all of these SI units represent? I think this might be fun for all of our viewers out there. They could, they could learn a little bit. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it started, and, and y'all can chime in when you're ready. All right, so ohm is resistance. Resistance of electrical circuit. And these are all electrical magnitudes. So, uh, and then amp, of course, is current, an amp. Volt, that one's an easy one. Voltage, right? Yeah. Okay, so this the next one is the one I, I had to look up. Uh, I, I, I thought I knew it, but I was wrong. Does anybody know what a, what a Coulomb is? You make me want to double guess myself, but it's an electric field, right? Yeah, it's exactly electric yeah. charge, right? It's the it's the not just the amount of current, but the amount of current per second that's passing through some electrical field. Yep. So electrical charge. What about a farad? This was the other one I had to look up. That's magnetic. Really field. To magnetic, yeah. Yeah. What what about it though? Something specific about that. I don't remember. Yeah. It's uh Lauren, you got it? No, no there's no magnetic charge, so. <laughs> I, I had to look it up. Yeah, so it's, it's capacitance. Oh. Capacitors are measured in farads. Makes sense. Yep. Um, and then um, a, a joule is energy. That's what joules measure. Uh, watts are power, um, energy per second, um, times, or energy times seconds. And then uh, the only reason I knew a Henry was because I was just researching this actually um, on, on what we were talking about uh, several weeks ago on the Astro Show. Um, does anybody know what a, what a Henry is? It's the only no. one I haven't heard of. <laughs> uh, so a Henry is a measure of inductance. Um, it's like the generation of um, like electrical power when you put a current through a curled wire and the interaction between the changing current creates a changing electric field. And that's how you get generators. Um, so electrical inductance, um, the creation of um, electrical energy by changing magnetic fields or the creation of magnetic fields caused by changing electrical energy. Um, and of course, um, uh, Thomas Faraday and um, um, James Clerk Maxwell were the ones who um, figured that out um, like 1860s or 1870s, something like that. Um, some pretty amazing experiments. But anyways. Also yeah, a uh, name you name your child. What's that? 
Also, I name you can name your child. You know, honestly, I, I appreciate that, Quib, but uh, I I am not gonna name my child after um, okay. a dead a dead white guy. <laughs> I do I do have some names uh, from. Uh, past grand grandparents and grandmothers who do happen to be white, and we're going to use the the first letters of their first names, and we're kind of mashing really? all that together into a couple middle names and uh, different first names for um, whatever the baby turns out to be. But um, no, we're not going to not going to do any famous physicists or uh, anything like that. They've um, they've already got their due rewards. But yeah, um, I thought this was interesting and, and a good um, kind of like flashback for me to. Um, college uh, electromagnetism class. So that was fun. <laughs> uh, and I've got some fun questions for all of you. Uh, so it is time to get into the news trivia portion of our show. Um, we've got uh, Lauren going up first, and then Michelle, Danny, and Valerie is going to go last this time. All right. Lauren, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here is your first question. At 8,000 kilometers per second, the fastest known star takes less than four years to orbit around what? So I don't know, but my guess is the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Yeah, Yay! you got it. Sagittarius A. Hard to measure a... complete orbits of things, so. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, uh, very, very fast orbit. Uh, it, it puts it at 0.25% um, the speed of light, which is, I mean, it's a small percentage, but light's pretty fast. Um, so yeah, this is the, the fastest star we know about. It is just humming around the, the black hole. Um, so great. Uh, one more, one more point for Lauren. Uh, so that puts you back uh, as a, in a four-way tie now. Everyone's got one point. All right, uh, next question. A new analysis by a team of physicists offered an innovative means to predict cosmological signatures for models of this mysterious and invisible substance. Is it dark matter? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Yeah, so the idea is that you can actually create a model using the cosmological constants that we know of, um, amount of hydrogen, amount of helium in the early universe and everything else um, that we know popped out of the Big Bang or shortly thereafter. And from that, we can predict um, uh, mass constraints for certain types of dark matter. I like the part That's of what, itself. That's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, I guess the, the first model of its kind that, that shows some promise. So it's pretty cool. All right, two for two. Um, so now you're in the lead uh, going for your third point. Uh, here we go. Um, next question. Um, by using the Doppler effect method within distant galaxy max 1149 JD1, that's a mouthful, researchers revealed that its blank is less than one quarter that of the Milky Way's. Uh, like there's a bunch of things that I could guess because I don't actually know. <laughs> um, think, think, uh, think really, really basic um, galaxy parameters. Yeah, my first guess was mass. Um, Not quite that basic. Okay, <laughs> disk but size. Very, very related, <laughs> very related to mass and disk size. Uh, I don't know. I think, mean, uh, sure. <laughs> think, think, think Vera Rubin. Oh, uh, it's what rotation rate? Yeah, rotation oh, rate. <laughs> <laughs> Those are related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Both apparently this problem. thing, yeah. this thing only. So this was done by the uh, the Atacama array, which we've got a picture of there, yeah. and um, yeah, what they found was the rotational speed of of this galaxy is only one quarter that of the Milky Way which is really interesting because this one is really, really far away. Um, this one is something like 10 billion light years away. And so uh, it's one piece of evidence that rotational speeds of galaxies might have been a lot slower back in the past. Um, who knows if that turns out to be true for more distant galaxies, but um, I thought this one was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool to be able to measure the rotation rate, something that far away. You have to be able to yeah, and they they yeah, literally did it by it. Yeah, they literally it. did it by using the Doppler method at two different parts of the galaxy. Right. Yeah. 
cool. Yeah, so it's pretty cool stuff. I've never heard of a Doppler method being used like within one galaxy like that, but yeah, apparently it's cool. doable. Um, all right. Well, you got all three right, Lauren. So you are in first place now with three points. Yay. <laughs> all right. And uh, Michelle, you are up next. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. First one's a gimme here. Yesterday, which new space telescope revealed the most detailed view of the early universe to date? Hmm. No, the James Webb Space Telescope. James oh. Webb Space Telescope. All right, so we, we had to have this image up here just to like, we're just gonna stare at this for a few seconds here. This yeah. is the coolest image um, I could have possibly anticipated from James Webb. So this is one of five images um, that got released over the last 24 hours. This was the first that um, President Biden got to um, talk about in his press conference yesterday. So it, it preempted the other four. And so what we were looking at here is a galaxy cluster, the big kind of fuzzy white blobs in the center. It's a galaxy cluster that's about 4.6 billion light years away. So what that means is that the light from those galaxies left there at around the time the earth formed, 4.6 billion years ago. So just, that's the kind of perspective we're talking about here. So this that light, those big fuzzy blobs in the center, that light left those galaxies 4.6 billion years ago. And there's way, way more. <laughs> so that galaxy cluster has such a huge gravitational field that it is actually warping the structure of space around it. It's basically creating this giant magnifying glass in space that we call a gravitational lens. And it's warping the light of more distant galaxies back around its edges into the foreground as these skewed, stretched out galaxies around the edges of that um, galaxy cluster. And so if you, if you see those weird kind of like um, long tenuous um, streaks of red and orange, those are the, the distorted images of galaxies much, much farther away actually behind that galaxy cluster that we can only see because of the lensing effect of the galaxy cluster close to us. So that galaxy cluster is 4.6 billion light years away. Those other galaxies that are skewed around it are probably like eight, nine, 10, 11, even 12 billion light years away. So we're talking about near the other edge of the visible universe, which is 13.84 billion light years away. Um, and not only do we get to see that in this image, we also see thousands of other galaxies strewn out all over space. Uh, speaking of space, uh, this image only represents the size of the sky that you could cover up with a grain of dust held at arm's length standing on the earth. So one grain of sand held up at arm's length, looking up at the sky, that's how much sky this image captures. So it was a wow. tiny, tiny little bit of sky and just, mm. just look at it. <laughs> it is so cool. Makes me wonder where the life is. Yeah, right. Not, no. not if, but where. Right, just where. <laughs> right. right. So every every little speck, every little speck in that picture, except the specks that have the the crosses on them. The crosses are um, they're optical artifacts of light from foreground stars inside the Milky Way. So there are about ten or so stars inside the Milky Way that we're looking past to look out to all these other galaxies. So all those ones with spokes are inside the, the Milky Way. Every other point of light is an entire galaxy with on average 200 billion stars, right? So the Danny's question of where is the life as opposed to if there is life, I, I think is very apt. There are so many galaxies out there with so many hundreds of billions of stars. How could there not be life? Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what a cool image. Nice work, James Webb, and the, the several thousands of people uh, at NASA and associated companies that put that together over the last 30 years. Uh, nice work, y'all. It all, it all worked out pretty darn well. Um, and some of the other images that were released are, are equally as stunning, um, different types of objects and one spectra of uh, the next solar planet, um, the big... Um, um, large, um, hot Jupiter, a big gaseous planet close to its sun-like star. 
that we now know has water vapor in that star, um, thanks to the spectra from um, the James Webb. So pretty amazing stuff. Um, sorry, I kind of went off there. Does anybody else want to <laughs> say anything about this? That was, that was my enthusiasm for the lack thereof from Biden yesterday. <laughs> I always think pictures like this are so humbling, you know, yeah. if like, if the study of space weren't already humbling, seeing an image like this, that's new, you know, and then recognizing the, like, just what a tiny snippet of, of reality it represents. It's yeah. just, it's mind blowing, but it's always very humbling. Yeah. You know, that we are, really we are just, just so tiny and so insignificant in the grand scheme. But yeah. So true. Yeah. Our galaxy falls within the grain of sand of one of these galaxies looking back. That's right. <laughs> Nicely put, indeed. Yep. All right, well, we better move along here. We're already running late per usual. <laughs> All right, well, you got your first question, Michelle. That gives you two points. Uh, one more to tie with Lauren. And here is your next question. Uh, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has spotted a new pair of what on the lunar surface resulting from the impact of a rogue rocket body? Um, a, a crater. You got it. Uh, a set of two craters. Yeah. Um, so we, we knew that that happened. I think it was back in 2016 or 2017. Um, but the image was just taken recently, actually identifying um, the craters. Um, still not understood why we ended up with two from one rocket body, um, as opposed to just one crater that we normally get when something smashes into the moon. So NASA is still looking into that. All right, Michelle, you're now tied up for three. Your last question for the lead. Jupiter. Not Jupiter. <laughs> Here comes your next question. Which billionaire space tycoon is backing out of his deal to purchase Twitter? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Yep. Uh, over a technicality, he's, he's now claiming that Twitter has not uh, done their due diligence to release the number of uh, bots that they have. Um, he said he was not going to buy Twitter unless Twitter could prove that less than 5% uh, of their um, subscribers were bots. And apparently they have not done that yet. Um, of course, uh, Twitter is fighting back. Uh, they're gonna take him to court over this. So this is gonna be an interesting uh, fallout <laughs> from whatever uh, happens here. It, it sounds like if he actually does pull out, he still owes Twitter a billion dollars instead of the 44 that he had originally um, claim to be wanting to and buy. And it will be interesting what happens to that stock as well. Yeah, we we shall see. Val, it looked like you were chomping at the bit to say something there. Go well, ahead. I just wonder if if Twitter fixed the bot problem, like how much would his <laughs> follower count fall? Like has he? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what this is really all about. It could be. And when is that truck coming out? Just say. All right. Uh, well, nice job, Michelle. You got all three right. You are now in the lead with four points. All right, Danny, are you ready? I think so. Okay, here we go. First question. SpaceX lit the engines of its first super heavy rocket booster, number seven yesterday, in preparation for it making a historical orbital test flight with what upper stage spacecraft? Um, I guess Artemis. Not Artemis, one oh, more chance. Uh, this is uh, not uh, not NASA's craft, but um, SpaceX's craft. Oh, but craft. SpaceX's craft. Oh, shoot. Um, no, it's the Starship. Starship! <laughs> We're going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. I've seen it being built, actually. It's yeah. enormous. It's yeah. enormous. Yeah, so like just the, the booster is like something like 165 feet tall, which is in the foreground of this picture. And then Starship is back there in the background, which is like another like 100 some feet tall. So this is like absolutely enormous rocket. Uh, I think eventually it's going to be able to transport like 100 people to Mars and back, yep. which yep. is pretty astounding. Yeah. All right. Wait, Next. And back. They can send it back. 
I mean, okay. Okay. that's okay. the idea, right? I mean, if they can launch it from Earth and they can land it on Earth, oh, they should be able to do that from Mars too. Yeah, um, the atmosphere is different. We, it is. I'd like to see it happen. <laughs> uh, I would too. Yeah. <laughs> Hope, I think we'll both live to see that actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Who was criticized by NASA for undertaking political activities on board the ISS? I think, uh, think the one of the largest international conflicts taking place right now. Oh, you mean Russia? So cosmonauts? Yeah, R Russia and the um, yeah Russian cosmonauts. They they displayed a flag on July fourth um, of the um, the People's Republic of um, I'm going to butcher the name the one of the break off um, areas within the Ukraine that has claimed independence. So yeah, they got chastised for that. Um, the ISS has always been apolitical as possible um, between Russia and the US, but uh, this seemed to frustrate NASA a little bit. Um, so we'll see what happens with it. It's really sad. It is really sad. And I, I'm, you know, these guys are not to blame. They got put up to it, I'm sure, by right. their 100%. boss. Yeah, they just had to do what they were told. So no, no shame on the cosmonauts up there. But um, yeah, come on, Russia. It, ISS is, is for science, man. Come on. Get in line. OK, uh, last question for you, Danny. The um, Tiangong Space Station has now been inhabited for over one month by which nation's astronauts? China. China. All right. Three points for Danny. You are now tied with Michelle for fourth place. I mean, first place. <laughs> OK, uh, Valerie, we got three questions for you. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. Okay, here we go. Which CubeSat declared its independence from NASA on July 4th by breaking off communications with the ground, which NASA was able to restore two days later? Okay, I hope I'm, is it Capstone? You got it. All Nicely right. I was just done. About that. <laughs> yeah, so Capstone is uh, this very, very interesting lunar orbiter that's going to do a, a totally different orbit around the moon than any spacecraft um, or orbiter has done before. It's basically going to mimic what the Orion spacecraft is gonna do um, after it gets up there in the, um, um, the lunar um, platform. So um, yeah, it um, <clears throat> somehow lost communication, but was restored uh, shortly thereafter. Nicely done. Next question. Uh, published yesterday in the journal Nature Astronomy, these findings from the OSIRIS-REx mission suggest that hopping dust makes what objects rougher than scientists expected? Um, I might not get this right, but is it asteroids? You got it, yeah. asteroids. Yeah, so this, is, uh, this uh, was from the evidence from asteroid Bennu. Um, that was uh, visited by the OSIRIS-REx mission. This is an incredible image of this huge puff of dust and rock getting um, thrown up by the lander, which uh, did not actually land on the surface, but 30 centimeters down into the surface. Um, that was just blown away as it landed um, very unexpectedly. Um, we had no idea the surface was so soft. It really is just a rubble pile um, of loosely contained uh, rock and dust um, by gravity, but there, there isn't a nice solid surface to land on there. So um, if this asteroid does make a near Earth approach in the 2100s, um, we've got some things to learn in how to deflect it. Um, just hitting it on the surface is not going to do it. All right, uh, last question for a three-way tie for first place. Here we go. The dream of nuclear fusion reactors may one day rely on these for routine maintenance tasks. I literally just read about them. Aren't they calling them hot robots? Hot robots, you got it. <laughs> yeah, so this is a little, uh, little drone here that's getting zapped by uh, some serious electricity. Um, yeah, the idea is that if we ever are able to build these nuclear fusion reactors, there is no way they're gonna be able to be maintained by humans, right? We're talking about like, sun surface temperatures in these things, or even core solar temperatures. And so we're going to have to create bots, uh, not bots, but robots um, that go into them and do the maintenance work for us. And so, yeah, 
uh, there's all this work to design these um, robots that can withstand just redonkulous temperatures. And um, they're being called hot robots. Uh, so we have uh, a, a new milestone, a three-way tie um, for first place. Uh, nice work, y'all. And uh, Lauren, we know you were a good sport and not picking Hubble. So uh, yeah, I think this is actually like a four-way tie here. So nicely done. Nicely done. Nicely done. All right, we are. You get, you get points for knowing the first of those SI, uh, you know, when we were talking through the various um, measurements the year of and paying off. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, that was a long time ago. Like I said, I, I I couldn't. I got Coulomb wrong, and I I got a Farad wrong. So I had to I had to look those up. But I knew the other ones. So pr pretty good, but um, not a not a four out of four like some of you did today. So nice nice work on that. All right, we are so late. Uh, we got to get our special guest on here. So we're gonna take a short break, and we're gonna be back in just a moment um, with Dr. Robert Hurt. Uh, so uh, grab a bite to eat and um, join us back here in. Just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with Dr. Robert Hurt from IPAC at Caltech. Robert, thanks so much for being here. Ah, it's a pleasure to join. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, I love your uh, your background, by the way. That is so cool. This is the this is the the pride of the universe. Uh, uh, the Galaxy M eighty two, seen in a diverse array of light, ranging from the ultraviolet to the infrared. All right, that's a, that's a cigar galaxy, Andrew, right? M82? Spitzer, some Hubble, a little okay. bit of everything in there. <laughs> nice. Uh, M82, is that is that cigar or Bodes? The Cigar Nebula. Cigar, yeah. Yes. Very cool. It's a, it is a particularly interesting galaxy for its just crazy different appearance, depending on whether you're looking at x-rays and you're seeing all of the, the, the supernova, the, the storm of material being blown out by the supernovas versus the infrared, where you're seeing the edge on galaxy. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a very cool multi-wavelength feast. Very cool. I love that. Multi-wavelength feast. I, if I can borrow that, I would love sure. to use that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, we are we are psyched to have you here, and uh, we like to start all our guest spots by asking all the guests the same question, which is, what's the one question that you wish everybody would ask you, but nobody ever does? Hmm. I think that might have to be, would you be the science advisor on Star Trek or other major science fiction TV show <laughs> or movie? <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's... Uh... 
uh, I, I it, it feels like a um, it's a thing. It's a goal I've always had. I uh, mm. a, a secret all the way back in graduate school. I actually interviewed for the science advisor position at, on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh, yes, kind of dates me. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I I would still say that next Next Generation is still my favorite Star Trek. <laughs> I. Uh, Actually, these days, uh, well, it, it, I would say Deep Space Nine was was mine after the original series because I'm I'm a child of the original series. Yeah. But I got to say, Strange New Worlds is a pretty strong uh, mm, yeah. uh, entry in that field now it, for a first it, season. It it started real strong, didn't it? Yeah. Um, so I but just, I, I but I love the idea. I have always, you know, I, I I didn't get that. That was actually when Narain Shinkar was advisor and he was becoming a story editor to go on to greater things. Yeah. You know, most recently, The Expanse, which is, is a really, really cool show. But the, uh, you know, it's the uh, fact that people, so many people will not watch a science show, but but popular media has such an impact. I, mm. I just wish we had a better pipeline for getting, mm. you know, creators excited about science so that they mm. just naturally want to put it into the things that they, the stories that they tell. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you love watching these shows. I love watching a Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. But if you actually watch that, astrophysically, you are coming out stupider than <laughs> right? you mean you can't like breathe out in space? What? <sighs> you know, it's just it's just, you know, anything. And the <laughs> idea that there are so many misconceptions that we are constantly yeah. trying to overcome. Because people, you know, like don't get me started on asteroid fields, right? You know, it's like- yeah. <laughs> I mean, asteroid voids. <laughs> asteroid voids, right? Yeah. As opposed to the, you know, the meat grinders that that exist in like every other show out there, eh, except for The Expanse. I, yeah. I gotta say, for, for, for getting an A plus on their science and astrophysics and their their Newtonian Mechanics 101. I, I, nobody's come close to the Expanse on doing things like that. Nice. I, I want to hear more about why you love the Expanse, but for our, our viewers out there, uh, tell them about what we're talking about with asteroid fields. Why are we calling them asteroid voids? And, and what is the tragic misconception that nearly every sci-fi movie um, <laughs> tells with, with those, um, those uh um, those, those incredibly exciting, like 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 meat grinders that the ships have to swerve and dive through. It's like, yeah, it's of course because you know asteroid fields are really sparse. <laughs> if if you are standing on an asteroid, odds are you won't actually, with your naked eye, be able to see the next closest asteroid to you. It is. It's just. It's just not that high. If, if it were like the, the amount of mass in our solar system, if it were, if our asteroid field was, was, was of the density of Star Wars or Star Trek, right? That, you know, 98% of the mass of our solar system would be in that asteroid field, not in the sun. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a little wonky. Um, it would, it yeah. would. Yeah, that, that um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the Expanse got it right though. Um, uh, say more about that. <clears throat> yeah, they they they, they kind of did. I mean, you know, story, I mean, and I guess this is maybe a segue into sort of what I do, right? I am um, uh, I, I'm an uh, uh, I, I go with the title that a colleague of mine, Frank Summers at Space Telescope Science Institute, um, it coined. It's the astrophysicist. <laughs> I, I am an astronomer who now specializes in science communication and specifically, you know, how we use imagery to you know facilitate understanding in, in astronomy and astrophysics in particular. And, and that can be imagery that's, you know, directly derived from data, like my, my uh, uh, M82 pride banner behind me. Um, I, uh, you know, for many years worked on uh, the uh, NASA Spitzer Space Telescope project. And uh, actually, if you pop over to the uh, my next slide, just show some of the pictures that you know I had worked on. I did a lot of um, data-based imagery for Spitzer over the years, which was you know for for until until now was you know our premier uh, eye on the sky for uh, infrared light. It was the complement to the Hubble Space Telescope because Spitzer really opened up the the far infrared universe to us. And, um, and, and I will say in the, in the joy of the day of like, just, you know, the, just the beginning of seeing everything that, that uh, web is bringing to the screen, you know, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't suddenly blow up everything that we've done for, for, you know, 17 years on Spitzer. It's uh, Spitzer is going to be the foundational science that web is going to, to 
leap off of moving forward. Speaking of standing on the shoulders of giants like you did before, you know, we, um, uh, web will do like astonishing things and will be able to show us things at incredible resolution that, that we can't see in the Spitzer images, but Spitzer, you know, it will never cover the area of sky that Spitzer did. And so it, that is going to be a, a treasure trove to mine for the questions that will you know, sort of fuel our next generation of, of uh, uh, research coming out of web and, and things that, that come after. But uh, yeah, so you know, working on infrared, but I'm not, I'm not wavelength um, uh, uh, biased. I worked across the spectrum. Uh, uh, there's another picture of um, the Andromeda galaxy from the Galax mission that I worked on. This is uh, the uh, ultraviolet view of our nearby spiral neighbor. And um, uh, one that I, I, has actually gotten some play uh, uh, in the media. I see people love uh, something about this like, like clicked because I, I just keep seeing it over and over again in the backgrounds and TV shows and movies and things. They, uh, they like this, but it was, you know, ultraviolet where all of a sudden now you're not looking at the dust, but you're looking at the, the bright hottest stars, the ones that have just formed, right? And they're the things that leap out in this image. Uh, there's such a beautiful complementarity to, the, um, to what you get as you move through the spectrum of light. And each one is bringing with it a whole different window of physics and phenomena that, you know, you, you need to put it all together to get the complete story. And the joy of working with data sets like this is just the opportunity to, to really take the science that's inherent in the data, but then try to make it as beautiful as you can too, because you know, any scientist will know that data is beautiful, but to be able to get it to a point that it's so beautiful that you want to use it as your desktop, you know, that that science, I, I feel like like astronomy is kind of like the gateway drug for science, right? Because, because you know, we can we can lure people in with just how beautiful the cosmos is. But if if that beauty can get people to start to ask questions of, wait, so so why does it look like that, right? That is the beginnings of trying to explain process and science and how 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 we learn over time and how our our knowledge our our awareness expands as we ask more questions and we build telescopes that go in, and so. You know that having that that the, being that privileged position to sort of be able to create this imagery, uh, you know, has always excited me, and it was uh, I, I just um, always grateful that I sort of landed at the right place at the right time with the right skills to be able to move and and, and do something like this to kind of uh, contribute for to science communication through through imagery. So how how did you end up where you are today? What's uh, what's the the path that now led you there? Well, ironically, I wasn't actually on the path to get here. This wasn't even a career I imagined existed when I was in graduate school. But uh, like so many things, right? I, I was always passionate about my hobbies. I've been um, doing space art since I was in high school mm -hmm. using you know, acrylic paint with airbrushes that you know, I'd, I'd be painting my nebulas carefully and then the paint would go all over and then all of a sudden, well, okay, it's a bigger nebula, you know, wow. <laughs> you know, remapping your happy accidents and things. But um, I, uh, you know, after getting my PhD and doing my first postdoc, I decided I didn't want to go down the, um, the, the traditional tenure faculty research position. And I, my second postdoc was here at uh, IPAC at Caltech, which is basically a science center for uh, astrophysics and planetary science. And so I was like, you know, I want to use my background in astronomy to, you know, like work science from a different angle. And so I started on a project called the Two Micron All Sky Survey, which was the first high resolution digital map of the entire sky uh, in near infrared light. And uh, while I was there, I, was, I started doing imagery for two mass, which I wasn't supposed to do, <laughs> except I wanted, I still wanted to. And, and I just kind of got a reputation for, for doing it well. And by the point that they were ramping up for Spitzer, uh, I was basically offered a position to to sort of settle in and, and take over the, the visual communication, sort of transition more into a science communication role. And so, you know, in retrospect, the only decision I made that took me on that path is I went to, I, you know, I wanted a, a research a postdoc at a place where I knew I'd be able to uh, connect to other like uh, uh, research science, but outside of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the 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 observe the the uh, what the university setting that was what I was searching for, yeah. you know it's I mean we're at Caltech but we're sort of independent like you know we're not faculty members at Caltech we're we're staff at Caltech, and so it was a little bit of just always pursuing my passion for art and three D graphics and Photoshop and photography, 
And then, you know, at some point, you know, if you have the skills and you ha- and you sort of get the chance to put them together in a different way, you, you might have opportunities to go into, you know, sort of unexpected directions. So. Very cool. I mean, my, my colleague, Whitney Clavin, who's, uh, uh, she's, uh, for many years, she was the uh, 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 press officer at um, uh, JPL for the Spitzer mission is now uh, working in the media department at Caltech. You know, she's managed to connect her joy of rollerblading and be able to use that for videos demonstrating things like angular momentum, you know, so who knows what kind of cool hobbies you have, you might find a way to turn into a a neat science communication opportunity at some point. (laughs) I I love that. Um, That's really cool. Um, well, I, I really want to show, I think it's the, the next slide that you have because it's, it's an, oh, not that one, but let's, let's talk about this one first. Well, and then I, I, well, this is a good it. transition. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, now this is obviously not database. Uh, this may come as a surprise, but not even the James Webb Space Telescope will actually show us an exoplanet with this fidelity. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of science communication, there are, you reach limits where suddenly the data doesn't actually tell you the story, right? You have to be trained to look at the data and understand what the story is. So that's when we, that's when we go to science-based art, right? And um, you know, over the years from Spitzer, but also other missions like um, Kepler, uh, uh, my, my colleagues and I got a chance mm-hmm. to do a lot of the illustrations that, that would explain exoplanet results and give that kind of cool visual to try to draw people into reading about all the amazing uh, exoplanet results that, that Kepler did and that ultimately Spitzer contributed to a uh, test mission, all of these, right? Uh, uh, e- each telescope, either whether it was a discovery mission or uh, like TESS or Kepler or a mission that would characterize exoplanets like Spitzer and now JWST, you know, the artwork again, is that thing that pulls you in. It's the thing you glance at and you say like, ah, ah, oh, this is about like some weirdly different alien planet. And so uh, I have really loved the chance to basically uh, sit down and and try to imagine what a number of alien worlds could look like within the constraint of the data of what we know. And and that's, that is kind of the fun thing is taking, taking the science, you know, the ideas that you want to get across and then with that as your, 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 your you know, the, the pin that you, you're, you're stuck in the, the bulletin board, right? Use that as your, your beginning point and then fill around the edges with the art to tell a story that's kind of visually compelling, but, but ultimately, you know, one that leads you back. Like, you know, this is, um, this is one of my hot Jupiter illustrations and, you know, finding a way to like create something that, that conveys that like molten hot look, but, you know, brightly illustrate, illuminated by its star. And, uh, you know, ways of, can I, if I could do a piece of art that just by looking at it, it already sets you up for a couple things that you're going to read in the article that mm-hmm. helps shape your understanding of the article, then that's where I think I've, I've succeeded in what I'm trying to do. And, you know, if you look at this and, and think, wow, that looks pretty warm. And then you go on and you read about it as a Jupiter sized planet. That's very warm, right? It helps. I feel like it helps frame some of those ideas that you want to get across. And it's, it's that, uh, that first step in the, the science communication process. As they say, uh, pictures contain a thousand words, right? Uh, at least, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, other than exoplanets, I've done other things. And I guess that's the lead into the next slide. Yeah. Um, this is the one that I was so tickled to see when you <laughs> when you uploaded your your images. So I have used this image for so long to teach people about the structure of the Milky Way. And I didn't even know that Robert was the one who created this. Yay. Uh, it is so cool. Uh, I'm so glad it was helpful. This was uh, so as an artist, <laughs> this is clearly my my Mona Lisa. <laughs> this is this is the one that I think has gotten seen everywhere. And and this artwork actually it was kind of an apology for its previous version, <laughs> <laughs> because um, working with a, a colleague, Bob Benjamin, uh, uh, who works in Milky Way structure, we did a press release for Spitzer, uh, gosh, goodness, that was like probably back in t- 2005 or something, give or take. And um, the Spitzer data actually uh, led to a revised um, understanding of how big the Milky Way bar was. and what its orientation was. And, you know, and then something that a lot of people don't even know about the Milky Way, especially if they grew up looking at all the old books that I did, right? The idea that there is a, a region in the center of our galaxy that basically is like a straight bar. Um, 
is a very common feature seen in galaxies, particularly ones that have some amount of interaction having gone on in the recent past, that you get this weird confluence of the way the, the, the stellar orbits get perturbed away from perfect circles into these sort of football shaped things that basically end up creating this just amazingly linear structure, right? Uh, that wasn't in any of the books I saw growing up as a kid. And it, even though we've known it since the late eighties, uh, you know, I, I, I go into planetariums and things and I still see old versions of the Milky Way that, that just pretend like there isn't a bar in the center. <laughs> so we, I, I did that initial artwork for it and I really got the bar just right. And then I just kind of painted in lots of spiral arms <laughs> and it was so pretty. And then all of a sudden that artwork got picked up everywhere. It was like, ah, this is what the Milky Way looks like. Then I started getting emails from other scientists saying, hey, well, you, you actually, that arm isn't in the right position. And there's another feature over here you left out. I'm like, yeah, I was, I was just doing the bar. And, <laughs> and my colleague, Bob and I like, were like, yeah, we really should fix that sometime, shouldn't we? <laughs> Bob actually organized a special session at a, a summer AAS meeting on Milky Way structure, because there are a lot of different groups that work on it, but they kind of don't talk to each other. You know, you have your maser people who are using radio telescopes to look at masers in, in, in star forming regions that give very precise locations. And you've got your people who count stars in the infrared and you get people who map out hydrogen gas using, you know, telescopes like the VLA or, or people that map out molecular gas using things like you know, the, the SMA. And, and they all get their own kind of map of how it is, but a lot of times they don't talk to each other. And so he, he set up a special session at the AAS to try to bring all these groups together and leading into that, we tried to take all of these different data sets and synthesize what was the best state-of-the-art knowledge at that time of, of the Milky Way structure. And, and that's where this diagram came from. Um, you know, it's, it was intentionally done a little um, illustratively, not to look like photo real, because I always wanted it to be clear that it was an illustration, not, not like the data from a telescope. Because yeah. you know you could do the super photo reel, but then literally it would look like <clears throat> like so many other pictures you get from Hubble. So you know it has a certain illustrative form that that you know we felt was important. You know I used color, I overemphasized color a little bit to help establish you know younger stars versus older stars. And but but already it's it's already so out of date. There's so many things like like probably should be changed at some point. And someday I hope to revisit this and do a really good uh, uh, updated version of the Milky Way. <laughs> Cool. Well, it's, it's fantastic. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've lost track of how many times I've used it with students to um, teach them about <clears throat> where we are in the Milky Way. And we're, we're in the process of building an observatory and planetarium in Jackson. And this is definitely the image we're going to use up there to oh, teach sweet. folks about the Milky Way. So thanks. Yeah. But, you know, I, I do other things too. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, What's fun about the art side of things is that, you know, you never know what the next thing is that you've got to sort of embrace the challenge on, right? It's always driven by the science. It's always driven by, you know, what the next press release is that we need to support. Um, like the next slide, uh, it seems like I've had a run of uh, black holes come across my desk in recent years. And I've done a lot of black holes and I, and I always try to get them a little better over time. And, and you know, kind of coming back to the, uh, the pop culture side of things, you know, it's, it's remarkable what a difference the movie Interstellar made for actually working directly with Kip Thorne. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, to have the luxury of having the 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 render farm of uh, 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 D squared or the the who is it digital domain the DD that did the uh, yeah. the, the viz for that work, and have the time and luxury of trying to do it correctly. And um, even though they made then. Uh, uh, certain adjustments to make it a little more dramatic visually for the uh, for the movie, but they still got 95% of the way there. And because of that, because no one would ever show a black hole with distortion before then, just because that movie had the impact it did, now all of a sudden it's everywhere. Yeah. They, 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 they animate the distortion in, in Star Trek Lower Decks in the cartoons now. <laughs> it's it's like, awesome, it's I love that, yeah. Ubiquitous. <laughs> so, you know, I've been, I've been playing with techniques to create uh, uh, qualitative versions of the light warping mm -hmm. around black holes since I was in grad school in the 90s. Um, this one was actually my latest one. And this uses, um, I shifted a lot of my work now to Blender, which is, you know, an open source uh, free piece of software that's out there and is actually now exceptionally powerful. And there are so many people out there with tutorials that have figured out tricks like the the one I use here that, that this again, isn't a proper 
relativistic ray tracing, but it has a lot of the character of it, much better than any of the old like like conical lenses I was using before. Yeah. And you know, and like there are YouTube videos you can go and people have figured these things out. And then I'm I can pick up and leverage and work into my own work. But uh, it's it's so exciting how powerful the tools are getting to be able to go along and create something that's a pretty good simulation of an actual relativistic code you know, that you can render in overnight and, and get something really uh, fun and, and, and clean out of that. So, I mean, even, even the most recent iteration of Cosmos, uh, they did not do lensing around their black hole. They went back to the billiard ball and I was just kind of astonished because that was, you know, post interstellar, but they, uh, I, they, they, I guess they felt it was too hard or they, they didn't go there, but, but I just love that, you know, even a tool that anyone can freely download and put on their desktop, and let them go and do like incredible work now and there'll be so many people help them learn more about it yeah yeah the these the amount of access that the amateur astronomer or, or artist or, or really amateur anybody has today um is just astounding compared to what it was 10 15 20 years ago because of the web um i mean i'm, I'm specifically thinking of just like the like the the telescope technology that the amateur astronomer can buy now you can, you can buy like a fully robotic scope with a, like a, a built-in um, um, CCD that will um, center objects for you. Um, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. And they're, you know, using sometimes, you know, cooled CCDs and yeah. they have <clears throat> incredible access to filters. Like the number of, uh, you know, amateurs who are, can now just do a really good job of replicating like the look of the Hubble images. Yeah. Not quite as sharp. But every bit is sensitive. Uh, the and the the labor that goes into processing. I mean, because you know the amateur data is often collected not under the greatest sky conditions, and so the work they have to do to get their data pitch perfect is actually harder than what like Hubble or or, or web processing I think has to do in many ways. And yet they can they 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 have really powerful, sophisticated software. It's actually. <laughs> way more sophisticated than the tools that we typically use for, for you know, NASA data for, for creating the imagery you see. So uh, yeah, they, it is just gorgeous. And because they work in wide fields, you know, they, they will get vistas that, you know, uh, uh, web will never see. Well, I mean, web will never be good at making giant mosaics. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's about the sharpness. It's not about the field of view. And that's an incredibly valuable area that the amateur community fills in for us. Definitely. Oh, what else do you have to show us tonight? Well, I have a I have a plug. Uh, oh yeah, if, uh, if there are any other questions, the uh, just a couple things. Um, so the group that I work with these days, uh, in part, is a, a project called NASA's Universe of Learning, and this is um, sort of a uh, one of the uh, uh, NASA's science activation projects to basically really engage people in, in the science that NASA does. And our purview, it's a collaboration between Caltech and Space Telescope Science Institute and, and Harvard Smithsonian and JPL, uh, basically to connect under the banner of astrophysics. And we have a lot of different projects that we do and a couple that for people interested in image visualization and uh, 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 you know, the, 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 whether it's a pre-created imagery or, or even want to try it yourself, um, we have a couple of projects that are relevant to this. One is the NASA's Astrophoto Challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's you just use a web-based tool that uses some of the same software that researchers do. It's based on DS9, which is a, uh, uh, you know one of the, I mean, not the best tool necessarily for making beautiful imagery, but it's uh, uh, it'll let you work with the same data sets that go into the Hubble image and, and make your own astronomy image. Um, it's a web-based uh, called JS9. It's JavaScript based, and we actually have a challenge going on right now to work on the uh, the Carina Nebula, uh, mm. sort of the same region that that uh, Webb put out. I mean, it, the uh, ground based data will cover that same area, but the uh, uh, we're we're focused on more the Eta Carina star on our challenge. But you can go in and use data sets from Spitzer or Hubble or Chandra, and or you can get a robotic observatory, ground based observatory, observe your own data for you, and then make your own picture. Um, if you go to the, uh, the URL at, uh, or just uh, Google NASA's Astrophoto Challenges and you can just jump right in and in 10 minutes you can be making your own space images. And, um, but if you want to actually go and look at the imagery that gets put out by Hubble and Spitzer and the NASA missions or ESO or you know, most of the, the really big observatories in the world, 
uh, the Astropix website at astropix.org. We, we are actually sort of your one-stop shopping for pouring through all of the original imagery that's released to the public through uh, you know, so many major institutions now. And it's like a good first place to go to find that imagery. And so we got the web imagery it's sitting in there right there today. And if you can browse it on our site, you can actually do things like um, see what colors in the image correspond to what parts of the spectrum. We have a little widget that when that information has been provided, you get a really easy way of interpreting what you're seeing like in terms of what those colors on the screen really mean. Uh, and if some of the images have all the, the, the projection information, you can click a button and it pops it over into Worldwide Telescope and you see actually where it is in the sky, and how big it is and what constellation it's in. So uh, it, they're actually, it's fun because Astropix, you can do things on the Astropix site you can't do on the home sites. Like, you know, you can't get the Worldwide Telescope window on the, on the Hubble site or the, the website or, or, or even the Spitzer site right now. But, you know, we're sort of a, we try to value add some new experiences and then you can sort of see how all the major observatories might have observed a, a particular area of sky. So uh, go check it out. That is super cool. I definitely will. I'm I'm familiar with the um, the Worldwide Telescope. I actually um, I know the founder. Um, and then I, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, he's, um, he's a good friend of mine too. So <laughs> oh, cool. And then um, Astropix is you guys do stuff with uh, with Apod, right? Astronomy uh, picture of the day. We I mean, there's sort of a synergy there. APOD is sort of like the flat <clears throat> HTML version of Astropix. <laughs> yeah, it's been around longer than wow. Astropix. And where APOD is really focused around sort of having, generating a new picture every day to look at, um, it isn't really much of a searchable archive, right? They right. just, you can just go and hunt through yeah. their list of titles and try to find things. Whereas Astropix, this is a collaboration between all of the, uh, many of the major observatories in the world that has dates back over 15 years now where we try to actually make sure all the imagery is tagged to a common metadata standard mm -hmm. and is put up on feeds that anyone can kind of pull in so that it gives you a chance to sort of find the imagery. They'll take you back to the original source if you need to. Uh, we also have um, this imagery that comes into Astropix can also be provided on feeds directly to observatories and uh, sort of to planetariums. So uh, there's a data to dome feed that's based on the same metadata standard that like you can actually, a lot of the uh, uh, planetarium software now can let you pull in sort of live imagery off of these data to dome feeds as well. So uh, it's, they are, they are very complementary purposes, I would say. Hmm. Very cool. You go to Astropix to find the thing you're looking for or yeah. to see everything in a particular spot of sky. You go to APOD for like, Give me my 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 uh, surprise of the day. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the beginning of the rabbit hole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, any any questions for Robert from any of the co-stars? I would just like to say I just love what you do. I love that you were saying that you have a beginning point and you start your art and then you fill around the edges. So then when you create that piece, it actually tells a story. It, so, it really you know, colors, is yeah. storytelling, that's, right? That's I mean, it. that's the bottom line. It's always mm -hmm. uh, that, that what you're trying to do. You're trying to tell that story. And, and the, the fun thing about science-based art is exploring that, that territory where, you know, all art works within constraints, right? You know, a haiku, you know, is all about like telling something innovative in that beat structure. I love science-based art because the science gives you the sort of fixed points, the things that you you have to keep there. And then the art, you can tell all these ways, there's so many ways to tell that story around those fixed points. And for me, that's always the the challenge. You know, how, how good of a narrative, visual narrative can I tell with that, uh, that creative constraint? I have a question that's sort of a haiku for you, uh, which if you had to only work in one part of the spectrum for the remainder of your art career, which part of the spectrum would you want to work in? Oh, I think it's still going to have to be the infrared. You know, <laughs> I, I started life as a radio astronomer. You know, I worked my way through the infrared. Uh, I've worked a lot with some Hubble data. I, I'm all the way out to New Star, which is a far X-ray telescope that goes out to even higher energies than than Chandra does. So I've I've worked the whole spectrum, but uh, but the infrared is so rich uh, in so many ways. You know, to be able to really see through the dust clouds, 
uh, you know, the fact that, you know, Spitzer can see through all the dust in Milky Way right to the, the stars in the center, you know, the, uh, you, you need to work in the infrared to see, like, to map out the orbits of stars uh, around the, uh, the Sag A star black hole. And it's the combination of that, plus the fact that the dust itself, the thing that, you know, in, to our visible light eyes is just the thing that blocks our view of the universe. You go far enough out in the infrared, and not only are you seeing through the dust, but the dust itself becomes the thing, the feature you're watching. It, it starts to glow. And, and dust is this beautiful tracer for where gas is at its densest, and it's so tied to the formation of stars. You know, it just, it, it just all, it's all, it's still all about the infrared for me. <laughs> nice. Danny, do you have something? I don't have a specific question, but I was going to say, like the work that you do is beautiful, and it's so interesting to hear about, you know, the background and kind of what what precipitated all of this. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Robert, I I can't wait to see the day when every sci-fi TV show and movie has their asteroid voice correct, and uh, <laughs> and when your when your name is on the the credits of the next uh, Star Trek series. <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen oh, thank you yeah, I, uh, I you know on the asteroid thing if you go search there is a um there's a video that a colleague of mine tim pyle um as part of universal learning we put out about a year ago called uh the astrophysics variety hour hmm. it's a it's a whole like 40 minute piece it's got like a bunch of different little shorts but one of the shorts in there is called space bees and that is a it's an adorable animated uh, like a five minute animated short about like spacefaring bees and versus the spacefaring spiders and the entire video it basically came out from years of me going on and on to tim about how much i hated the asteroid fields in hollywood and he literally made a whole animated featurette about like uh uh, uh just just illustrating pushing that point out there like i love it how, how sparse the asteroid fields are so go go hunt down space bees if you want uh, a very funny way of uh <laughs> think exploring the idea that it, hollywood could be wrong <laughs> <laughs> i will definitely check that out um well, robert are there any words of wisdom you want to uh leave for for us or our uh, our viewers tonight uh, I would just say, uh, you know, uh, if, if you love the imagery, space imagery, go and make some, <laughs> you know, you can start with the extra photo challenges or, or if you're an artist, you know, make your own illustrations, you know, anyone can do science based art and science inspired art, right? It's, um, all you have to do is go and, and read something. And, and if you get excited, make a picture of it <laughs> and share it. <laughs> That's how we tell the stories. That's how we get people excited. That's awesome. Um, thank you for that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a, a thank you gift for you that I'll, uh, I'll connect with you about after we finish up the show. But um, we really appreciate your time. And um, we really appreciate all the um, amazing science-based art that you've done over the years. It's, um, it's um, both inspirational and educational. Uh, which is what Wyoming Stargazing is all about. So thank you for that. Awesome. Um, thanks to all the co-stars. As usual, uh, we wouldn't be here without all of you. Thanks for making the show what it is. And to Gavin, our screen master, and everybody else behind the scenes that makes Wyoming Stargazing possible, especially our board of directors, all of our supporters, and all of you out there who are watching. Uh, we want to hear from you. Give us a call. Um, chat your questions next time and your comments. And um, thanks for being part of the Astro Show. We'll see you again in a couple weeks. But until then, be well and don't forget to look up. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>